Welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the monthly live mineral webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the SMMP, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in on the first Wednesday of every month and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is is Mineral Talks Live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our November 2021 show. It looks like you all dodged the ghouls, goblins, and small, furry, ferocious animals of Halloween, and we're thrilled that you could join us today. For those of you tuning in for the first time, don't flip the channel because you just found Mineral Talks Live, the best hour-ish mineral talk show on the internet. Today is Wednesday, November 3rd, and welcome to our show. Mineral Talks Live is the monthly mineral talk show where we sit down with people from all facets of the mineral world to learn about what they do and who they are. I'm Brian Swoboda, president of Blue Cat Productions, and for this month, I'm thankful for having two of the best partners a person can ever hope for on a show like this. I'm speaking, of course, of Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez from the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayu from the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP. This is our 55th show, and throughout it all, we've been incredibly honored to sit down and chat with some of the best curatrix, curators, collectors, dealers, miners, researchers, artists, and media people in the mineral world. I think it's obvious we're having a great time, and we appreciate all of you who have been along for the ride. Without you, we wouldn't have a show, and the first Wednesday of every month would be just like all the others. So thank you for watching. Click the subscribe button below, and be sure to tell your friends about the best mineral talk show in the world. Now, one thing about this show that's unique is that this isn't just a conversation between me and my guests. All of you get to be part of the show by participating through the chat feature or the Q&A feature, both of which are located at the bottom of your Zoom window. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching the live show. As we're all about community, when you first sign on, go ahead and fire off a hello to everyone telling us where you're from. Also, if you have general thoughts or comments during the show, this is where you can post them and interact with each other while we're talking. Usually our guests and I aren't able to read those comments, but never fear, Raquel and Eloise will be very active in the chat area and may even interject a question or two to us during the interview. So now, what if you have a really burning question and you want to ask, but it's a little bit off topic from what we're discussing at that moment? Well, in that case, go ahead and type it in the Q&A section and we'll do our best to get to that at the end of the show. Finally, at about 40 minutes into the program, you'll see a window pop up on the screen asking a bunch of questions of our, and that's our Quick Fire 5 segment. This is where we get to see how well you know our guest. And yes, we play along too, as we're not even sure of all the answers to the questions we ask. Now, being based in Hawaii, clearly that has lots of benefits, except when it comes to field collecting. There's the old joke that Hawaii only has one worthwhile mineral, peridot, which my buddy Eric DiCarlo and I have pretty much disproved. However, the belief still exists. And that brings us to today's guests. One of the things we have in common is that we both live in states where the diversity of minerals is underrepresented. So we're kindred spirits in a way, and based on what you're about to see, I think you're all in for a nice surprise. Representing the land of enchantment, our 47th state, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Virgil Luth of New Mexico. Virgil, how are you? I am fantastic today, Brian. Thank you very much. So glad to have you on the show. Great to be here. Fantastic. Now, Virgil, as you know, with all of our guests, we like to start the interview by kind of going back in time a little bit and getting to know how you first became interested in minerals in the first place. Can you tell us a little bit about the background there? Well, for the most part, I grew up in a small town in western Wisconsin, and I spent a lot of time uh, out in the woods. I was uh, hunting and fishing and uh, in, in enjoying nature all the time. There it is. Uh, that's Spring Valley, Wisconsin, home of the largest earthen dam in the Midwest. And uh, there's the little town itself. Down in the lower right is the high school I went to. My house is on the left side of that photo, up on the top of the hill. We got to look down into it. Right up in here, right? Right up in there, yeah. Yeah. So, and and when we were talking yesterday, Brian, there are a little bit more town that kind of 
goes up the valleys on each side. Uh, everywhere a valley comes in, the, the town spreads out a little, but it's only about okay. a thousand people. Yeah, Welcome and that, where your light is on the top, on the north end, that's, uh, that's Mines Creek. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But anyway, I grew up in this small town and on the rocks. This is a uh, Shakopee Dolomite caps the uh, ridges, has little bugs in it with crystals that are brown and sparkly, kind of like a youngite from uh, Wyoming, except it's brown. Um, and they were fun to pick up, but I, I never had much thought about that. It wasn't until I went to high school. And well, actually, uh, maybe the next picture will also help us here in third All grade. Right. All right. In third grade, I went to the tourist attraction in Spring Valley, Wisconsin called Crystal Cave. It's the, the largest, longest cave in Wisconsin. It's been a, a tourist cave for a long time. And in third grade, everybody at Spring Valley High School or Spring Valley Public Schools would go to the take a field trip down into the cave. And in the cave, they had a number of, of things. In fact, they had a mineral collection down there. That was the first time I'd ever seen uh, something other than quartz or calcite or, or dolomite or sandstone. And it had some beautiful little pieces. They even had a black light display. And so as a third grader, it was, I found it just totally amazing and the geometry of them. And I thought it was really cool, but I'd never really acted on it or anything like that. It wasn't until I went to high school. Oh, but yeah, let's let's go to the next picture too. Another reason I liked I liked got into geology and it's that giant brick tower. It's actually an elevator that used to feed the iron ore into a blast furnace that was located in Spring Valley in the 1920s and 30s. There actually was a thriving uh, um, iron mining uh, industry going on in here, residual iron ore deposits. Uh, they're mostly surface mined and things like that. And that's the last remaining uh, object from those days. Uh, and it sits there right next to our football field. That's the high school football field. Uh, a high school football field, and that what's, little. What's the mascot there? for the high school? Yeah, it's the press box where, when I was a senior in high school, I filmed the the games for the coach using a super a super eight millimeter uh, uh, film camera. See, Virgil, anyway, there's something else we have in common. You were you were doing filming back then. Way back, yeah, and I dropped it pretty good. I wasn't very good at it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Virgil, what was the mascot for the high school? They are the Spring Valley Cardinals. The Cardinals. The Redbirds. Yeah, yeah, Redbirds. And they were really good football teams when I was in school. They were state champions a number of years in a row of the small school variety, of course. Uh, and so, you know, the, the old mines in the area, when we were out hunting or hiking around, we'd look at the, these things. And they were always fascinating to, to look at that, that something happened a long time ago that, that I didn't get to see as a, as a in, in live action. So then after I graduated from Spring Valley High School in 1977, I went to the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire, the university about 45 miles away, uh, further east into Wisconsin. Spring Valley is actually about 45 minutes east of St. Paul, Minnesota. So we weren't, it's a small town, but we weren't very far from the Twin Cities and a lot of people commuted uh, to that place. So I went to Eau Claire and, and there I, um, uh, my freshman year, I was still a business major. I went to be a business major and found it excruciatingly boring, uh, but I still <laughs> was trying. And But that's that spring, the outdoor club took a, a backpacking trip to Big Bend National Park in Texas. And when I backpacked for a week down there, I, I totally fell in love with the Southwest and the desert. And I also wow. felt, I, I also realized in retrospect that I saw these great rocks, these great formations, and I just wanted to know more about them. Mm -hmm. And so when I got back, I decided to enroll in a geology class for a, in my sophomore year as, a, as an elective. And instead of taking rocks for jocks, I decided to take the, <laughs> the course for majors, which I, I never regretted. I just enjoyed it completely. And by the time that semester was over, I had decided that I need to change majors. And so uh, I took summer school and night school throughout the rest of my career, still graduated in four years, but I have twice as many credits as I need. <laughs> wow. And so, and so then when, once we went to, uh, uh, we got, we both graduated. My wife, Lisa, is also a geologist. We met in geology class. And at first we really <laughs> didn't think much of each other, but eventually we got acquainted and, and now the rest is history after 39 years of being married. Um, Congratulations. So after 39 years, how often do you still say, babe, we rock it? I try to say it every day if I can. Oh, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, we, after we went to Eau Claire, we both graduated. I, I hung out an extra semester for Lisa to finish. Um, 
at her. She started a year after I did in college. So uh, I delivered pizzas for a while and took classes uh, in uh, extra classes that I, so I could keep, keep up in my geology. I took geochemistry and things like that. And then uh, Lisa and I both decided to apply to graduate schools and we applied all over the Western United States. Uh, but one of them that we I expressly wanted to, to uh, apply to was the University of Texas at El Paso. Everybody, we call it UTEP. It's the old Texas College of Mines. Go Miners. That's how you do it. There you go. <laughs> right on. And, uh, and so, uh, and Lisa goes, oh, I don't want to apply there. I've mean, been applying all day. It costs $40. It costs $60. All these places are, you know, we don't have that much money. And I was reading the stuff and I said, no, Lisa, it's free. There's no charge to apply. And so he, she goes, and being the practical person she is, she says, well, it does no harm then if we don't, you know, it can't pass that up. And turns exactly. out when we were uh, offered uh, positions or, or student scholarships there, they, they basically uh, ch- gave us twice as much as almost any other university did. So we ended up going down to, to El Paso. After a stint with the USGS, uh, we worked in the US Geological Survey for a summer out in Washington state up mm. on the Colville uh, Indian Reservation. And we were mapping up there on a project. There was Mount Tolman was a Maui deposit that they were trying to develop. And the, and the Native Americans up there wanted to uh, have a better idea of how much resource was really on their reservation. And so the USGS came in and, and we were uh, student assistants out there. So we, we got out there and as soon as we got there, she was sent down to, uh, uh, oh, what's the, down near a place called Nespelum. Uh, down by the big, dam. I can't remember the name of the dam. I lost my train of thought there. And I was stuck up in Omak, Washington, the other side of the reservation. So we spent our first summer apart after we got married just before we left. Uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Though. Are you that or that's when Lisa found a dog and adopted it and brought it to me to take care of after uh, we got there. So our first dog, Omak, was uh, was named after the town where near I was staying. Yeah, anyway, we mapped there and then we drove down to at the end of that summer, we drove down to El Paso, got there and then sometime in the mid-August, late August, and uh, pulled into town at 10 p.m. And the temperature was 110 degrees. And at we night. got out of the car and go, oh, my gosh, what did we get into? <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, honey. My, we embrace living on the border. Uh, people always have a negative opinion of El Paso, but I've always really, really liked it. Yeah. And so once we got there, I, I studied under uh, Dr. Kenneth Clark. He was uh, the economic geologist there. And I did my thesis on SCARNs. And if you can pull up my next picture, Brian. Will we go to the Continental Mine down near Hanover, New Mexico, just north of Silver City? It's a, a big open pit SCARN. It also has some underground workings, but I, I confined my work to the pit. And just to the right of this photograph is where the intrusion came in. And you're looking at the Paleozoic section there. Uh, you got some dolomites on the lower right. And as we work up, there's that white stripe through there. That's a that's a dike that goes through or a sill that's basically poured, uh, coincident with the purchase shale. And then above that are the Pennsylvanian and Permian age rocks. And even at the very top, there's a little bit of white you see. That's the Colorado uh, sandstone, which is Cretaceous. So this whole package of limestone and shale has been completely altered to garnets and uh, paroxenes and, and other things. So I chose a, a deposit that has a plethora of minerals in it and I usually have some spectacular minerals in it. And I like to point out that that, that little speck at the bottom there is my 75 Ford Pinto, um, which is at the bottom of the pit. Now, a little story here is when I got to this uh, to the Continental, the mine manager was uh, Richard Graham of all people. Dick Graham, and, and we just had his sons on the program uh, a couple shows ago. Right. And, and, my, and my, uh, uh, Dick, I asked him for a mind map and he said, you know, I, I, I really don't, I don't think I, I don't have one handy right now. Here, I'll give you a plan map and, and why don't you go out and, and make your own? And I thought to myself, ah, he's making me map this pit by myself. Oh, well, I've only been mapping all summer long out in Washington. Uh, I can do this. So I spent two days mapping the pit. And after that, uh, Dick, says, hey, can I see your map? And of course, he unrolls it, and then he unrolls the mind map that, that I wanted in the first place. And, and he complimented me on, on what a good job I did. And then he said, well, come over to my house tonight, and we'll look at my collection. And I got a chance to see his Bisbee collection, just he and I in his house in Hanover, uh, 
to see those amazing Bisbee pieces. Oh my God, and, what and again, a treat that was. Totally blew my mind. Again, you know, I, I was never into you know, high-end minerals or anything like that. I was a, a more of a, you know, practical geologist thing. But boy, when I saw them, I just, they're just so amazing. And I, 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 I just fell in love with them very much as anyone would, right? Absolutely. And hey, so, Virgil, um, before we go, before we go on to the next uh, image, um, we've got some uh, people asking questions regarding the Pinto right there. Uh -huh. uh, they want to know, was that called the uh, Pinto of love or was that the passion Pinto? Yeah, they could say that. I don't know. It's too small to have much passion in those things. <laughs> <laughs> It was more or less a functional vehicle. That was all. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, after that interjection. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I guess. But uh, we had that a long time. And eventually I sold it to a, a, a fellow grad student at UTEP and he took it to Houston where it finally died of skin cancer. <laughs> well, then after uh, I, yeah. Well, after I got my master's degree, I, I was looking for a job in the mining industry, but it was at a, a real a downturn at the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the professors there, Dr. Philip Goodell, uh, he convinced me to stay on and do a project down in Hulkani, Peru, uh, looking at sulfur salts. The idea was that uh, sulfur salts could be studied and, and maybe behave like amphiboles and could be used as petrogenetic indicators of temperatures and pressures and, and phenomenon that go on during the mineralization scheme. So I picked a picture of an anargite that uh, is on the market today from the Arkenstone. Uh, if you could put that, yeah, and that's uh, that's those pyrite counted anarg coated anargites. And the reason I, I picked this one out expressly is that my advisor, Phil Goodell, was responsible for getting a lot of these out during the 1970s when he was a PhD student at Harvard and doing his dissertation on Mukani. And so I was doing my dissertation on Mukani and studying sulfur salts and uh, and found out some really interesting things. And so again, Phil was an avid collector and had a really nice collection. And so there again, I was, I was immersed in, a per, with a, uh, associated with a person who really had a passion for minerals and beautiful minerals. And, and it seems like this, this theme keeps coming back, you know, had these collections, minerals, beautiful things that uh, I resisted for a time, but uh, eventually I, I succumbed. I had a little collection of my own. It was strictly a, uh, mostly uh, self-collected, mostly with a teaching in mind. And uh, so uh, I took it with me to my first job. Uh, interestingly, when I finished my PhD in 1988, uh, I was looking for jobs and the job here at Tech was open and I applied. And I also applied to a number of other universities. I, I always believed in like, kind of where I came from in Eau Claire that I wanted to teach, uh, I wanted to go and teach at a, at a university, a teaching university. Right. And that was kind of my goal, but I applied to this job, but it wouldn't close for like two months. And I was offered a job at Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas, a Texas A&M school, um, two months before this one even closed. And so I, I withdrew my application and, and went, to, went to Texas with my wife and my three kids because we just had a, our baby and the last one came as a pair. So we had three <laughs> little kids under the age of three. Uh, and uh, so we had to go where the, where the paycheck was. And we went to Tarleton. It was a great situation. They hired Lisa also on, this, on the faculty. And I, I enjoyed teaching there. I had a lot of good times. I got some grants. I would work on the summer on my research. And then, and then I would teach during the year. But then uh, I got about, uh, see, 1993 in the spring, I was promoted to associate professor and tenured. And about a month after that happened, I got a phone call from Phil Goodell again saying, Virgil, your dream job is open at New Mexico Tech. The mineral job is open. And I go, oh, man, I've always wanted that job. It sounded so cool. So I applied. And that's how I got to Tech. Um, next picture, uh, I, you know, even when I was at, in Texas, I was constantly coming back to New Mexico. And this is a, a group of students and adults who I, I came back to, to give a talk to the a thing called the Celebration of Our Mountains in El Paso, where you go out and take people out to look at geology. And I'm tasting that funny look on my face is I'm tasting the turquoise, of course. I'm <laughs> testing it to see how, how chalky it is or how clayey it is. And people are around me looking at me going, this guy's nuts. And, you know, people don't eat rocks. But I'm standing on the Demueles mine, which was a famous turquoise mine. And every time I had a chance, or Lisa and I had a chance, we'd come back to New Mexico. So 
coming back, coming to this job at tech was always a, a, a high, uh, you know, was always something we had talked about. When I first applied for the job before I went to Texas, Lisa didn't think she could go to Socorro. She'd been there for the symposium that we've had. And I, I gave a couple talks at previous symposia. And she goes, I just don't know if I can live in that place. You know, Socorro takes takes a little bit of a <laughs> thinking. A bit of getting used to. Yeah, yeah. But it's a wonderful place. You know, you're out in the wilderness. You can go out anytime, go anywhere. And people are wonderful. Uh, it's just small. And uh, <laughs> so we came back all the time whenever we could to, to, to New Mexico. And, and, and then once this job came open the second time, Lisa said, let's go. Let's okay. go. Yeah. And that was then when I came here and took this job, uh, Lisa uh, then uh, got a job at in the Argonne Geochronology Center. She's an igneous petrologist. So she started working in the, a very famous laboratory here where they date rocks using the Argon Argon technique. So it worked out for us both to keep our professions going and, and both of us here at the Bureau of Geology. Well, I love it. Well, I mean, your story is a story of the mineral world reaching out and constantly grabbing you and pulling you into it. I think that's different than most of the stories that I've heard. I mean, you obviously had a, a deep passion very early on for it, but then the opportunities just kept saying, Virgil, come, come, follow this me. Is, this is your calling. This is your calling. You just exactly. got listening. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, Brian, I, the thing I, I, I really uh, love geochemistry and, 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 and when I was just learning about geology from my, my high school geology teacher, Jean Lundquist, who was a scientist at 3M, um, before she was a teacher, uh, she took us on this geology trip. I, I first was a time I realized that I, I, the science of the earth, what a great thing. It's a little physics, it's a little chemistry, and it's, a, there's a little art to it and things like that. And I just thought, ah, man, what a, what a great thing that I could be able to do. And, you know, being a forensic science, the, the objects are there. You just have to figure out how they got there. Right? Absolutely. And, and so minerals became the natural as a, as, you know, focusing on geochemistry, minerals are what I work with. Right. And, and so, um, that that's that kind of leads me. My research has always been about minerals. In fact, uh, well, even in Texas, like you, there's nothing to collect in Stephenville, Texas. Really, mm -hmm. there aren't. You have to go to Lampasas or go all the way down to the Llano. But uh, I, I ran across a neat little project that had to do with uh, uh, microbes creating submicron magnetite in people's water wells. And I got this real wow. quick. It kind of looks like this. This is a jar of that. And there's the, the magnetites on the bottom here. This is settled out. When you shake it, it takes a long time for this to come out. So if this came out of your pipe, uh, you wouldn't like it very well. It's all black. It doesn't hurt you. Okay. So anyway, and, and so studying submicron magnetite was really a cool thing. And, and geomicrobiology was something I'd never thought of before. And so I found a project to do down there with minerals that are really tiny, but yeah. interesting. Incredible. Well, now, Virgil, this year in Denver, you gave a fantastic presentation on the exploration into the causes of color and fluorites for the Denver Gem and Mineral Society. Now, that was a great presentation. For those of you who weren't able to attend, Blue Cat Productions was on hand, and we recorded the presentation. We'll be releasing that video soon. But based on your presentation, it would be understandable if someone were to say that your favorite mineral is fluorite. However, they'd be dead wrong. In fact, your favorite mineral is something that has far fewer colors, and I'm referring to gyrosite, which is basically rust. Tell us about what's so interesting about rust. Well, Brian, I, have to, I hate to correct my host real right away, but I, I just want to say that yeah, I, I don't have a favorite mineral. They're okay. all special to me. Like my children, yeah. they're all very special in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, gyrosite, the greatest mineral on this planet and on Mars. Uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, if you could show a picture, you know, here again, it's, it's this Phil Goodell keeps coming back. My advisor, I, I love him very much. And there's this little mine down in southern New Mexico, right on the border called the Copiapo gyrosite mine. It was mined for this yellow gyrosite, which was used in paint pigment back in the 1920s and 30s. And this is a, a picture of the wall on one of the, at the ends of one of the levels underground. And you can see that it's just massive amount of gyrosite. Well, most gyrosite forms from the weathering of pyrite. And, you know, it's left over behind and it's often mixed with, with gypsum and, and gertite. But this is just massive gyrosite, tremendous amounts. And those black things you see in there 
are actually chert class that didn't get replaced. The limestone completely got replaced by gyrosite, but the chert class are still surviving and, and stuck in there. And you're looking right at a fault. That's why that line goes down the middle and the hammer's uh -huh. like it is. And so this is a massive deposit of gyrosite. And Philip, Phil goes, birds, or he calls, he called me Viger. Hey, Viger. Oh, why don't you date that stuff? You got an argon lab and all that stuff. And he said, well, what a great idea, because this is really a, a remarkable deposit, you know, and really unusual. Casey Dunham, when he first was, uh, described it back in the early 1900s, called it a remarkable deposit of gyrosite. And so we uh, tried to date it, and it, it came out with really excellent uh, results, really excellent results. But another curious thing, though, every time I analyzed it with, like, I did an x-ray on it, I'd always find fluoride in the pattern, although you could hardly ever see any fluoride in the mine. And that bugged me for a while. But And then I also uh, hooked up with Bob Rye at the US Geological Survey and who was at, happened to be working on acid sulfate minerals at the time doing stable isotopes. And so this jar site, um, you know, you talk about this being mineral talks live. Well, actually the mineral started to talk to me, uh, the jar site did anyway. And when I asked it about its potassium, it says, well, I'm 5.2 million years old based on my radiogenic isotope ratio. And then I, I asked it about its sulfur, you know, using stable isotopes. And it told me that the sulfur came from um, either uh, geochemical reduction in the subsurface or from bacteria in the subsurface. It came as H2S it was coming up and because it's very light isotopically sulfur wise. And then I, I asked it about its oxygen and, and hydrogen and using stable isotopes there. And it said the water came from rainwater that got down deep in the basin and came back up. And, and so it was being circulated in these large circulation cells in, in, in the Rio Grande Rift where we live. And, and then it also told me that, uh, you know, the oxygen in the OH site versus the oxygen in the sulfur site were different. And that's a temperature dependent separation or fractionation. And so it told me it was 130 degrees that it formed at. And so that's what I mean about gyrosite being the greatest mineral on this planet and on Mars, because since it's been discovered on Mars, right, if we could get a piece of it, we would know how old it was, when the oxygen was there in abundance enough to make gyrosite, when the water was there to make the gyrosite, and get some idea where the sulfur came from that made that gyrosite. So it'd be, you know, it, it has a lot to do with our understanding of Mars if we could just bring a little piece of gyrosite back. Right. You know, and that's fascinating because when you and I were talking earlier, I was asking you, uh, couldn't you analyze uh, Martian meteorites to uh, to find the answer there? But uh, you said that no, because there's there's no way to determine if if there's any gyrosite in the meteorite, if that was from Earth or from Mars, it would basically be a contaminated specimen. Perfect. And yeah, you wouldn't know if the gyrosite was formed here or, or on Mars for that matter. Yeah, and, and these gyrosites here are that we're talking about. Uh, at the Copiapo deposit were actually a different kind. They're hydrothermal, they're high temperature. They're not weathering gyrosites. That was the, a main contributed uh, thing that we contributed there. And one day I was working in the museum in the Hansenberg case, and there was a specimen there of fluorite and gyrosite in quartz. And that's when the light finally went off in my dim head. I thought, oh my gosh, it's just a matter of scale. Copiapo has fluoride in it too. It's just, I don't see it, but Hansenberg has more fluoride than gyrosite. And once I realized that and the light went off, I said, I'll go to every fluorite deposit along the rift and see if I can't find gyrosite in them. And we did. We can find, you know, looking at where in the, in the sequence of mineralization it happened, we found more gyrosites and dated all the deposits up and down the rift. And, and that's what uh, kind of led us to, you know, to, to what we did and it, it made it more useful. Hydrothermal Sour gas hydrothermal gyrosite is what we call it. And right. it's, it's a lesson to be learned. Um, I let Bob Rye name the stuff and he said, oh, let's call it sour gas. And then everybody calls me Dr. Sour Gas. Now, right? <laughs> so you gotta be careful. <laughs> Can't even trust All right, you. so there's the hidden origin behind Dr. Sour Gas for those of you, <laughs> you who go. are wondering. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Not, it's not methane. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, you know, if you're real quick, I should show them the Martian landscape there, Brian, sure. and, and the blueberries and things like that. There we go. And so, gyrosite's been associated with something like this up there. And, and that's why it'd be really cool. I've done a few things with NASA on, on, on meetings and stuff, but. That'll happen in about 20 or 30 years. You know, I just have to be patient and, and maybe it'll be gone when I get back. And I'd yeah. like you to show me the next slide because I want to introduce you to someone. Uh, this is my wife, Lisa Peters. Uh, she's the working in the Argonne Lab and we were out in the field here in the Magdalenas and she's sitting on a manganese 
oxide vein with calcite. And you see the hammer sitting on the calcite. Uh, it's another uh, non-traditional mineral that we decided to start dating uh, is cryptomeline. And in, the, uh, in these deposits, whenever you get right at the uh, interface between the black manganese and the white calcite is typically where we'd find the mineral cryptomeline, which is potassium manganese oxide. And we'll take a, we'll go ahead and take the next picture. It'll show you a close up of a kind of a pretty one. Okay, there's cryptomeline. All right, sitting on some rhyolite. That's a black fuzzy thing. And again, this time we, we approached this subject to, or this topic a little different. We knew the age of mineralization where this sample came from. This sample is about as big as your palm. It's from the, the uh, Luis Lopez Manganese District, which is about six miles from where I'm sitting to the south of Socorro. And based on cross-cutting relationships and age dating of rocks and, and faults there, we knew that the age of this cryptonoline should be around 6 million years old. Having known an age based on independent geologic uh, constraints, we took it to the Argonne lab and dated it, and lo and behold, it came out 6.2 million. So it came out exactly right and kind of validates the use of cryptonoline age dating and cryptomeline is associated with all the hot springs up and down the Rio Grande Rift from up north all the way to the south. We can find manganese deposits here. So over the last few years, we've been uh, studying the age and duration of these geothermal systems using cryptomeline age dating. Uh, and again, now recently they found manganese oxides on Mars and it's become hip and trendy to, to look at manganese oxides now. So, I've always been lucky enough to be working on something uh, that I was curious about at the same time something develops on Mars and that kind of is kind of cool. So let's go to the next slide, Brian, and, and, and kind of segue to, yeah, there we go. That, that, that fluorite that was, that halite, that, that blue halite that was there earlier, that's from Carlsbad. And that's the original thing that got me, there you go, interested in, uh, in the color of, of, of ionic crystals, right? And, we did some experiments on these things. We tortured them a bit. We blasted them with shortwave light and we heated them. And the blue coloration is quite permanent, but the purple coloration is not. Mm -hmm. And so most of the research on, on this kind of coloration says it's caused by colloidal sodium in these structures. And because of its permanence, that, that's kind of how it works. So, and the sylvites are the white crystals. Those are potassium chlorides. And, and again, potassium, potassium, potassium. Potassium is radioactive, right? All potassium is radioactive. So it's been dosing these uh, halites for a long time. And it's that Permian in age. So that, that's been like at least 300 million years. So they, they've been getting a high dose of radiation. That's what we think it turns them blue or causes the colloidal things to happen. So taking the next natural step, of course, to take it to fluorite which you popped up there just earlier. Uh, and this is one from Hansenberg. It's a hexoctahedron sitting on top of quartz. It's about the, uh, it's a little, it's about the, the, the fluorite crystal is about the size of a golf ball. Okay. And the coloration there. And so that's what got me into the, what was causing the color of fluorite. So I've been developing these concepts of form and, and color uh, just on the side, because in a museum, you have access to such a diverse uh you know, a collection of minerals that you can see so many things that other people don't get to see. You have to travel around to see them all, whereas they're all kind of gathered together. And so that the museum and research really go together because you have the ability to look at a lot of things and test a lot of things and, and explore variations that are very hard to find except in a museum, of course. All right. Sure. Now, speaking of the museum, uh, the museum is hosted at the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. So Tell us about the institution. What does it do exactly? And what role does the museum play in that? Well, the museum, well, the, the Bureau of Geology is the New Mexico's uh, geological survey. Okay, mm -hmm. so we do everything. We have 52, over 50 uh, scientists here at the Bureau, all different stripes, all different varieties, uh, petroleum, economic geology, uh, stratigraphy, mapping, hydrology. So we're, we're the state geological survey. Uh, but the museum existed long before the Bureau of Geology did. In fact, the museum was uh, um, came about uh, as as in part of the enabling legislation that the territorial legislature started used to start the school that was here, the College of Mines. Okay. In fact, in, in the enabling legislation, it says that the uh, university shall maintain geological and mineralogical cabinets, which is basically a museum. So the museum started the same time as the school, 1894. And it's existed ever since. In fact, uh, we have I have a series of pictures of all the museums that have gone through 
that we've gone through here at, at New Mexico Tech. So there's the first one. That is the that is Old Main right there. Yeah, that's the first building on campus. The museum originally was up in the belfry and then eventually moved down to the first floor on the extreme right, which is behind the trees. This was the first building on campus. Very and we good. actually have a picture of the inside of that museum, the next one. And there it is right there. And it's got those beautiful Queen Anne cases and there's the rocks. That's the first museum at New Mexico Tech. It was famous. It won World's Fair medals in 1904. And uh, those the two objects in the back center, those two round objects in the back center are the gold and silver medals that the collection uh, attained from those world fairs. So it was a spectacular museum until about 1928 when it burned down and the entire collection was lost. No way. Yeah. Wow. So that, and the whole building was lost. In fact, they saved, managed to save the student records through some heroic efforts by uh, Mrs. I um, can't remember her name, but uh, one of the university secretaries grabbed the files from the, from the safe and saved them before the building burned up so that wow. everybody who had gone before at least had their, rec their academic records still present. And then they built a new one called Old Main, which is uh uh, still on campus today. Oh, you guys, you got to go back one picture, Brian. This is Brown Hall uh, now, and Brown Hall is named after C.T. Brown, one of the founders of the university and a, a famous geologist for uh, New Jersey Zinc here in New Mexico. And the museum was reestablished on the second floor here uh, and existed there. And the, we had a Coronado Corto Centennial was happened. Uh, some, I don't remember the exact date, but the legislature formally named our museum Coronado's Treasure Chest at that time <laughs> nice. and it, it languished in the brown hall for a long time and kind of was it it was benevolent you know it was not really kept by a curator or anything like that but the collection was still there until 1963 next slide and this is that oh that's the okay that's that's right we'll go with this one this is the collection that when the bureau took over the collection in 1963, it became part of the New Mexico Bureau of Geology. The museum formally was folded into the bureau, which actually started in the 1920s. Uh, this is an interior view of the, that museum. This is the museum that I came to in 1994. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and so that, that it was more or less a, almost like a basement hallway. There were no windows. It was just a cross uh, walk through the building and they had these cases in there and, and this was the museum at that time. Well, it's gonna be great when we finally get to go down in the museum and uh, let people see what it's look, yeah. looking like. And so is this one, what came after Brown Hall? Yeah, this is the gold building uh, that gets its name from the fact that uh, scientists at New Mexico Tech started buying up uh, government uh, surplus computers and then they rendered the computers and took the gold out of them and, and built this building. Ah. <laughs> they called it the gold building. Of course, that's illegal now. So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but this is the gold building. Uh, it looked like you see it says Mineral Museum and the Bureau and the State Mine Inspector. My office was downstairs on the right. And then the, up on the top right there is the classroom. And then the museum was to the left. Let's go in the museum real quick. The, oh, a little quick story. It's going to be quick. When I first got here in, in July 4th, 1994, my boss, Chuck Chapin, uh, told me he's going to send me to museums all over the West. And I was I was charged with building, uh, creating a policy manual for the museum. And so I, I did that. And then the second thing he told me I had to do is he threw some plans at me and some floor plans all rolled up and said, oh, and by the way, we didn't tell you this during your interview, but you'll need to design a museum with the help of an architect. Uh, and you're going to do it really quick because we're going to build it in a year. <laughs> and so this was the gold building footprint. And so... Next slide, it shows you what we did. That's the, that's the interior of the gold building. Uh, on the front left, there are sales cases. And as you walked in, were these walk-in cases that you could get in through the back and work on. And then this, this cases on the, thing, on the back wall there were different um, mining districts. Um, it was, I modeled these cases after a, a German paleontological museum. Uh, in amongst the stuff here when I inherited my job was a was a little booklet about a paleontology museum in Germany and and this was the case design they had and I liked it a lot so yeah we've... and that brings us to the museum and this is what it uh, the outside is, of it today it, this is the 19 uh, 2015 we moved into the new Bureau of Geology building and it actually has a dedicated museum space for the first time not something renovated and when you come up to the main entry to campus, we're right on the front corner. We can't be missed. The old building was in the middle of campus. People had a hard time finding it. This one's front and center. 
right on the corner. It's got a park in front of it, lots of parking for our visitors. It, it's it's a wonderful facility. And the next play, you know, we've kind of glimpse of the interior before, but when you look in from the atrium, this is what the museum looks like inside. And uh, and you notice a lot of that beautiful light coming in. We usually don't let that happen. This was for, for photography purposes. You don't want sunlight <laughs> on your minerals, right? This so we stay. did this just to, for the photographic effect. It doesn't always look like this. But anyway, uh, that, that's our museum when you when you look first look in the door. And my office is up there. Those windows at the top, that's where I'm sitting right now, is up in my office. And in a short time, we're gonna I'm gonna walk out of my office and take you to some sites on top, and then we'll walk down into the gallery. Virgil, why don't we start that right now? Uh, I know that you have to switch cameras and maybe while we're doing that, uh, Raquel and Eloise can launch the poll and uh, then we're gonna go for a tour of the museum. And let me tell you, this is absolutely a fantastic uh, tour. I think you're all really gonna enjoy this very much. So um, Virgil has got a uh, uh, an Android phone on a gimbal and we're gonna switch over to that uh, shot as soon as We've got that ready, and let's, uh, Raquel Eloise, let's turn off his mic on the computer, and um, we can hopefully get his mic going on the, uh, on the portable. Virgil, I don't think you have your mic on on the uh, portable yet. Mute. There we go. Oh, oh. now, okay. Yep, we can hear you fine. All right, well. I'm going to walk over to this window. I've got a beautiful second floor, uh, beautiful second floor. Uh, there we go. Oh. And this is Virgil's office. This is what he's staring at all day. Uh, papers on the wall. <laughs> there, that's better. Okay. I thought I muted it, but didn't. And from my office, I'm looking across the Rio Grande Rift. Wow. Full of faults, things like that. Anyway, it's a beautiful place, Socorro. Now we're going to walk over to one of our rooms. And this is, I think you guys will like this. This will be a real treat. Now, this is horrifying to me as a, as a curator. <laughs> this is our education room, and it's a mess. Uh, that's because we're busy getting ready for our silent auctions at the mineral symposium we're having in less than two weeks, and we're staging things here. And we're also in the middle of processing a collection that was recently donated to the museum. And all those cases I just panned, including all these boxes here, are part of this collection. It was a gentleman who lived in Albuquerque, and he collected since the late 1940s all the way up until almost the 1990s, as far as we can tell. So this is an amazing time capsule of collecting. And he collected a lot, of course. And in some of these boxes, like I want to show you this. Here is a box full. I didn't have my sound coming back to me. So you might have been talking and I didn't do anything. <laughs> no, no, we're just listening okay. to you. All right. And so like here, this is a rhodochrosite from Sunnyside. This is a box full of rhodochrosites. They're all, they're all numbered, it looks like. How many rhodochrosites have you added to the collection? Well, you know, I'm not sure exactly how many there are here, but uh, uh, there's another one. There's a box of silver, oh. box of smithsonites from all over and other things like, uh, I gotta show you this. This is a, a drawer of Hansenberg linerites and Barotian tights. No kidding. Oh Probably self-collected. There's some evidence that he collected with Gary Young, a famous collector here in New Mexico, who ran this Southwest, Southwest mineral store up in, uh, up in Albuquerque and uh, Wolfenite anyone? Now, those are wolfenites. Is it just from uh, the U.S. or is that also from Mexico? Mexico, U.S., Southwest. Wow. Spectacular things. And then he also liked to polish agates. And so we have a phenomenal collection of agates. This is just one drawer of perhaps 20. My God. And he also polished azurites. 
He Sad. also has drawers of azurites. Those are galenas and stuff. But anyway, pretty amazing. And these kinds of donations are really important to our museum because uh, we use them in order to generate a lot of our funds in order to acquire other specimens. We'll talk about that a little later. And then over here is our reserve collection room. And you can see that we have, keep them in steel lane cabinets. They're all individually locked. This is a high security area. Only uh, Kelsey, my curator, and I have access other than the director of the bureau. And, and how so many pieces do you have in the collection? Uh, we have over 20,000 uh, pieces that have been cataloged. So now I'm going to step down the stairs. You saw this earlier, and quick, I'll look down the museum. There we are. And now I'm going to go down the stairs and not hurt myself. But on the way, we're going to pass our little ichthyosaur here that's on the wall. It's from Germany. We have a few fossils. We have a modest fossil display. And now I'm going down and looking into the atrium or the entryway of the museum as we go past Fred Vilda's paintings that we uh, right. were graciously donated to us from Marty Zinn. Fred's a real And treasure. this is Kelsey's office. And this is what we call the, uh, the Chino Copper Guillotine. <laughs> is Kelsey in there? Can we say hi to her? I'm going to hopefully run into her here somewhere. Uh, obviously, okay. she's uh, not there right now. But look how busy she is. Her office is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> and then now I'm walking along the front of the museum. And these are our sales cases. We sell mineral specimens in order to generate funds to build new cases, to buy new specimens, things like that. Now, Virgil, you and I were talking about this yesterday, and that's quite unusual for a museum to sell pieces from their collection. But you have a, a very ironclad policy when it comes to donations. Why don't you share that with the, uh, with the audience? Yeah, well, we, we only accept donations without restrictions. Now, we tell all our donors that some of the pieces in that collection that are coming to us may be sold or will be sold. And if they don't like that idea, then we, uh, we tell them that we will not take the collection because this is the only way we can, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, efficiently uh, get new things as well as be able to, to, to survive. Uh, Kelsey gets her half of her salary from museum sales. She's not, she doesn't get only half of her job is hard money. And so these are important things to us. Now, to me, that, that is a very practical approach as storage is always at a premium and people, if they donate collections and expect it to uh, you to store everything, if they're not really uh, things that you need in the museum, it becomes a problem for you. Yeah, and that's, this that's, seems very practical. You can release things back into the mineral world. Uh, there's no behind the scenes shenanigans going on and it benefits the museum, which means it benefits all of us. That, that is correct. It's, it's worked very well for us these 27 years I've been here. When I first got here, our museum only had $400 in a checkbook. And as soon as the uh, administration realized that we, uh, we had a checkbook, they had kittens and took it away, but they established a funding mechanism that allows us to, to do what we do. And that also allows you to purchase new specimens. And we're going to see a, a case a little bit uh, later of uh, new acquisitions, but it gives you funding to go out and purchase new specimens. So you don't rely on donations, correct? That we do have, we love donations too, but we don't have to rely on them. So oh, there's exactly. Kelsey. Everybody was wondering. Hey, she Kelsey. <laughs> Good to see part of you. <laughs> she's our, she's our award-winning curator. Right on. Uh, All right. What are we looking that, at here? You know, Kelsey uh, took a case up to Denver when I couldn't go one time or, or at the same time to set up. So she set it up and that's the only time we've ever won the educational award from the Denver. Yeah. Club. So hey. never, I've never been able to do it. Yeah. There's life introduce. telling you something right there. That's exactly right. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you here to one of our most famous specimens and that's the CT Brown Smithsonite. Wow. That is humorous. Very large. It actually is hollow underneath and fits on my head. Kelsey has, <laughs> Kelsey has a picture of that. Okay. Oh, I was going to say a hundred bucks for a photo, but since it already right. exists, I would draw. <laughs> and then next to it is a, a super big 
barrel from the, up by Las Vegas, New Mexico, in the Sangre de Cristos. It was given to us by Frida Gruninger. Gruninger, she's a little old lady, and her husband was managing the ranch up there. And uh, they hauled it down the mountain, and it was Frida's rock. And also, another one I want to show you is the thing we call the ice cube, perhaps the largest blue halite in captivity uh, given to us by Phil Simmons, one of the guys who brought them out. That is amazing. That's one of our, our kind of our famous things. And this is a, a case of New Mexico minerals. It just says, uh, you know, minerals of New Mexico. There's really no rhyme nor reason to the uh, how we have things set up. They're just randomly distributed to show the, uh, the fabulous diversity of mineralogy that is New Mexico. You know, we're a tectonically active place. And because of that, we have a lot of diversity in our minerals, being in the Rio Grande Rift and, and geologically active. Um, it, it's a great place. And this is a, here's another mineral I want to show you. It's a slab, but that there is the, the first specimen that we dated cryptomaline from right there, just mm. because we could. And then um, here's our new acquisitions case. Early when you see it, this case was uh, donated to us by Marty Zinn for this purpose. And so we have a lot of, all of our new pieces in here. One of the newest ones we've just gotten, I'm going to shake this a little bit. I got to take something off here. Excuse me. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. There is a Savorite from the Marilani Hills, a recent that's acquisition. A, that's a nicely sized Savorite right there. It is. And here's a beautiful Ludlamite, Vivianite, and Pyrite. From Peru, given to us by Joan Masagué, Joan Masagué, uh, one of our benefactors here in the museum. And so you can see, and then we have some specimens from alums, donations, and some of them we purchased. So we are always showing off the latest and greatest. All of these have arrived in the museum within the last year or two. Wow! So all these arrived uh, during during COVID, basically. That's yes, the COVID. You know, our, our donation has never slacked during COVID. That's fantastic. I have an interesting thing. And now as I move across the museum, the, the only arrangement we really do have in the museum is actually geographic, okay? okay. And uh, so we have cases of Mexico, South America. We have cases from Europe and, and uh, Australia and US, New Mexico, of course. We highlight New Mexico material because that's, that's our charge. Of course. And we also have a few pieces here that are tactile, we're, they're, they're made to touch. So if you wanna recharge your spiritual batteries, you just come in here and focus it right here. That's fantastic. And there's some out in the, there are some out in the uh, atrium also, so that okay. you know, we like to be able to have people be able to touch something like this, kind of fantastic, right? When you get to hold a, a, a fantastic specimen, it really kind of gives you a thrill. And that's kind of what we're trying to convey to our visitors. Well, I and think we are very one. tactile animals, and so that's yeah, right. it that's makes right. a lot of sense. And here, I, I, I got to show you this. This is something that's very old-fashioned, but we actually have a systematic collection. And Great. the British Museum probably had this particular kind of, of arrangement. But uh, being the geochemist I am, this is my favorite because it's the one I get to play with. And so there you can see our golds and silvers and platinum and stuff like that arranged in the Dana method, and a tribute to one of our founders, C.T. Brown. We have his book, System of Mineralogy from Dana, that was his, and that's his, uh, his bookmark, C.T. Brown, on it. Nice historic book there. Yeah, you know, and, and you notice uh, many of our cases have artifacts in them. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We mixed that in in order to diversify the interest you know not everybody likes rocks i don't I can't understand that but it's true <laughs> <laughs> and and so now i'm at the minerals of the americas and i want to point out a couple of really neat pieces there's a nephantavite right there in the back really fine specimen of that of that rare mineral from down at charcas we got that from uh via a gift from the sanchez collection where they bought it for us but then it came from benny finn ultimately Benny and Finn. Benny also, uh, he was very famous for the San Pedro Coralitos nematites. He was oh, look he at that in Las Cruces, New fantastic. Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we got this from Don Moore. Don Moore owned uh, 
what they call the uh, Pebble Pups Rock Shop down in uh, Las Cruces. And he got this from Benny. And so anyway, we got Las, the New Mexico connections all over the place here. And this isn't a New Mexico collect connection, but it's one from uh, Peter McGaw. First time I saw this specimen from NICA, it was sitting on the, the hood of a Jeep. <laughs> Peter, Peter sent me an email saying, you want it? <laughs> <Our site. laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, each one of these guys has a story, you know, some of them are funny, some of them are sad, yeah. but uh, this is some of our, our material from, uh, from the Americas. And oh, again, yeah. here's some more of our systematic display. Now, those are very elegant pedestals that they're sitting upon. Uh, could you get in close to one of those so that we can see it a little better? Okay. All right. So I'm going to, there you can see that when you get up close to them, you can see the, uh, the, you know, the, the sign comes through the, the acrylic block. But if you're not looking directly at it, it's not as easy to see. So that way you can keep track of what mineral you're looking at. And then we arrange them in such a way that they kind of look like a crystal structure, I think. Yeah. So anyway, I, again, I love this thing. That's I beautiful. sometimes just come and stand by it myself just for grins. Oh, wait, I didn't show you this very important specimen. Look at that jar site from the Mohina mine down no in okay. Chihuahua. I think so. That one's 3.6 million years old, by the way. <laughs> anyway. So here's a, another set of cases in our museum, and, and these are New Mexico specific. They highlight particular New Mexico mining districts. And this is how nerdy we are, Brian uh, and everyone. Uh, I'm standing on the south end of the museum looking north, and these districts are arranged from south to north. So you can take <laughs> a walking tour through New Mexico mineralogy. I love it. So now we're I down in Las Cruces near the Oregon Mountains, famous for these Fabulous wolfenites from the Stevenson Bennett mine. Oh, those are great. But more recently, spectacular myelitic cavity specimens have come out that from the granites down there. Big plate of feldspars, the most common mineral in the world. But lots of fantastic things. The other thing that Stevenson Bennett was famous for were these cerusites, giant things. Wow. And now we're moving to Silver City real quick and the, and the famous Chino mine, Chino and uh, Tyrone. There's a beautiful old native copper given to us by Marty Zinn. That is and a fantastic have a, a, copper. Yeah, we have a, a shelf of all kinds of native coppers that were mined at different times throughout Chino's history. So you can kind of see a, a historical rendition of how the, these all these coppers were coming out at different times. And we even have some of the old secondaries, which are almost unheard of. You know, and this is one of the things that I remarked on when we were going through this yesterday. I had no idea of the variety of copper that had come from New Mexico. And just look at this, the breadth of shapes and crystallizations. It's, it's fantastic. It's quite amazing. And then when I were here at Fanover Fierro, these are specimens from the Continental Mine. There's a Nandrodite specimen from the Continental. I didn't collect that one, but I saw things like it when I was in the mine with Dick Graham and some other specimens, the famous Aragerites from the Hanover mine, Hanover number two. And it was also famous for these beautiful cadmium smithsonites. Beautiful. And then we're in the middle of the state now, about 40 miles east of where I'm standing right now is Bingham, Blanchard, or Hansenberg, famous for these great Fluorite specimens, exotic secondaries like spangolite, brochantite, and of course the best ones, the giant linerites. Wow. There's a linerite being pseudomorphed by malachite, or at least coated. And a little further through, now we're at Magdalena. Who could not go to Magdalena? But here we try to highlight the different varieties or occurrences of smithsonite, not just these fabulous big brainy chunks <laughs> are great. We even have smithsonites that are the correct color. You know, all smithsonite's supposed to be white. And we have a beautiful rosacite and hemimorphite. This came out of the Miguel Romero collection down in Mexico. Fantastic. More smithsonites. 
cadmium varieties, uh, pseudomorphin calcite, and there's one pseudomorphin cerusite. That's a great course, piece. There's our beautiful, one of our uh, iconic pieces of Smithsonite that we got from Roy Johnson, who actually collected that when he was a student here <laughs> and donated to us. And here are, are some nice specimens from the San Pedro area, uh, the site of the first, the first uh, gold rush in the Western United States. It was not California. It originally came to New Mexico. Then they found out how- the California gold, gold rush and the Colorado gold rush. Right, and then and then they found that it was so so uh, not very good. So they they went to California, and then they came back later to try to clean up. And then here we have some. Uh, here are the pegmatite deposits from northern New Mexico. There's a rather large crystal of monazite, and some other things. And let's see, where did that go? Let's see it. Oh, here's an interesting thing: New Mexico emeralds. Some bigger ones have been recently found and uh, extracted, and we have a few big ones now in the museum. Wild. And another thing we have are guest displays. This is uh, turning around. I'm looking at three different guest displays. We try to change them out once every year. This one is from Michael McCaluk, a young collector down in Las Cruces who is into microphotography. So he goes and collects these specimens, puts them on display, and then he shows us the pictures where he does these stacking techniques. And then it's these great. exhibits stay up for the entire year. Yes, it does. We usually change it right around uh, symposium time. These have been up a little longer, but because of COVID, we decided to leave them up longer since we were closed for a time. Sure. And this is a display of uh, minerals from Alan Betty Tlush. Some of you people may remember Alan Betty. They own carousel gems and minerals. Uh, they're from Belen, New Mexico, but originally from Pennsylvania. And this is the, the, the last parts of Betty's collection, which she gave us a few years ago. She loves Smithsonites from around the world. So we have quite a Smithsonite collection from Betty from all over the place. And then we have a fossil wood display from Dennis Umschler. He's a collector up in Albuquerque. And he collects exclusively New Mexico petrified wood. So we have quite a cross section of all that exists for New Mexico. We also have a little case here of minerals, of uranium minerals. New Mexico has some of the largest uranium reserves in the United States. And we select these minerals carefully so that they aren't too hot that we can't display them in public. Nice. And another case here, we're highlighting gold and silver from New Mexico. And this was amazing to me, the crystallized gold that you have there. And you've got a couple of huge nuggets that you're going to show us there. Yeah. And this, in fact, that's the 18 ounce nugget from New Mexico, the largest one in captivity that we know of. And then there's a, it's a partner there that's uh, 12 ounces. This is a beautiful eight ounce nugget from San Pedro. Those are from down by Ruidoso, <clears throat> Lincoln County, uh, where uh, near, uh, well, the famous, what's the town over there where Billy the Kid was in prison? You know, that, uh, Lincoln. Lincoln, yeah. Yeah, and then this one here, cute little thing, kind of looks California like we call, I call that one the dead bird because it looks like a bird that fell out of the nest. <laughs> okay, anyway, and that's there and then, uh, we also have some more general interest type cases. This is one Kelsey put together during COVID. This is a, a display about the, the Trinity site and the first atomic bomb blast. This was originally That's just shown right off there. at the yeah, sure. German Dugan Museum in Farmington. And now we get a chance to exhibit it. And going along with this theme of Trinity site, she put together the radiation station, which is a series of historic Geiger counters, those from the 40s and 50s, all the way up to some that were issued during the Chernobyl incident from Russia. How interesting. I love that. And then, you know, over here, those are minerals from Europe and Africa in that case, and minerals from Asia and Australia in this case. 
and some of them are more uh, educational to exhibit. What is a pseudomorph? And we keep it simple. We have pyrite and agurtite, calcite and siderite, a series of aragonites, all replaced by different things, orthoclase pseudos, and of course, and hydrite pseudos. And then on top of that are, uh, is a display of pseudomorphs from Mount St. Hilaire. So this is for the real mineral aficionado, those who really love pseudomorphs. This is a, a fantastic display. We got almost all of these things from a single donation by a daughter of Peggy Gross. She was a now, collector. Is that, is that Aaron Delventhal's face print I see on the side of the glass there? Yeah, probably. I think we. I think our worker washed the cases today, though, before this okay. show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then I'm going to walk back. We also have a modest gemstone collection and gemstones. People love seeing gemstones and they're colorful and they're beautiful. Yeah. And then we also have a display of lapidary art. It's a very popular thing in New Mexico. A lot of lap lapidary artists. And the significant, significant things in this case is that might be the world's largest sphere of Kelly Smithsonite. It was actually made by Wolfgang Mueller from a piece that I gave him from one of our historic pieces in the collection. It was a large bubble of smithsonite on a, on a specimen that we broke out and he turned into a beautiful sphere with very little waste. Fantastic. It's one of my favorites. You really have such a variety of things uh, that you have. I love, there. I love this agate, right? That's the happy agate. The, the smiling face agate. <laughs> That's right. It's, it loves us being here. It loves living here. And this is another very significant item here. This is the uh, American Faceter Faceting Machine, serial number one. Al Tlush, who I mentioned before, uh, and his brothers started this company, the American Faceter. And uh, they basically, in a lot of ways, popularized faceting for the general public. And Al had this machine, and, when, and one of his last donations was this original number one off the assembly line of the American faceter. Fantastic. And then we have minerals from around the United States. Many different varieties, as you can see. Again, we didn't arrange them in the 50 states. I try to get one mineral from every state, however. In Where's order Hawaii? To, uh, so everybody feels good, right? They can say there's one from every state. What we do you have, have from Hawaii? Uh, I have a calcite from Hawaii. Oh, nice. Yeah. I hope it's not cursed. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we even have a pyrite from Mississippi. Check it out. Wow. All right. And then we also have some other displays, petrified wood, our normal petrified wood display from all around the world, but focusing on the Western U.S. and New Mexico. We have this excellent meteorite display highlighting mainly New Mexico pieces. And as education. we talked earlier, those, uh, none of those are lunar or Martian meteorites, but um, they all did land in New Mexico. Most of them. There's a few Most ones okay. few that aren't. Oh, here, this is something funny. and It's not funny. See that, that meteorite in the back left that's crooked? Mm -hmm. They they recently repaved the street just to the north of our museum, and they used one of those pounders that shake the earth. Right. A bunch of our minerals spun on their axes. There's one we missed. <laughs> that was very nerve wracking that day. I, I can imagine. <laughs> and we have a, a a case of New Mexico agates. And they're beautiful, and I like this one a lot. It might be what the, the, the audience is thinking at the end of this thing. Oh, my God, is he almost over? <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> and we have minerals from around the southwestern United States, in this case, Colorado, Arizona, uh, Nevada, California. Uh, a highlight here, of course, is this giant glove mine, Wolfenite. Wow. From the glove mine, incredible. Yeah, I took it to Tucson a number of years ago for the, you know, and that's the last time I moved it. It's really mm. heavy, but it's it's a beauty. Uh, we have it here at New Mexico Tech because the mine supervisor was a tech graduate, according to Dick Bedeau. 
Right on. It all comes around. Yeah, and then over back here is our, again, more New Mexico minerals. I'm almost back to where we started, so I kind of made the loop. <laughs> and there again, we have a lot of artifacts that we in, in, integrate. These are some mining, these are mule shoes from a Dawson coal mine, Dawson, New Mexico. I got these from my local veterinarian. <laughs> Donated them to the museum. And they're kind of different. They're different than regular horseshoes in that they have kind of a little beveled edge. And so it covered the front end of their, their hoof a little bit uh -huh. so they wouldn't wear out so fast. And of course, we have wonderful specimens. Here's a beautiful fluorite from Pine Canyon next to some azurite roses from the Copper Rose Mine. Great. There's a really neat piece of turquoise from the Porterfield workings down at Tyrone and a commemorative spoon from the World's Fair. He attended 1904, I think, in 1903. 1904. And that's him on the spoon, by the way. That's Porterfield himself. He always wore that silly hat. Ah, gotcha. At the top of the spoon there. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, other fluorites from different places. These are some cave needles from Stanton Cave. You no longer can collect I those. Just, I mean, really, look at the variety of stuff from New Mexico. Amazing, isn't it? And there's even is. some really weird things. There's a kyanite from up at La Madeira, which is up by Ojo Caliente. You know, nothing like the Brazilian stuff, but very interesting little spans. Mm -hmm. And I got to show you the ugliest specimen in the on the collection, on display, that hexagonal looking thing, which is a cyclical twin of cordierite from up by the Harding mine. And I think it kind of summarized how we feel about minerals in New Mexico, we want to show a lot of variety and a lot of uh, examples of how diverse our mineral, our, our state is, mineralogically speaking. Absolutely. I think you've done a fantastic job there. Thank you. And one, the last one I want to show you is this case here of turquoise from a gentleman named Rex Nelson in Albuquerque. I knew Rex the first time I went to Texas El Paso. I met him in the early 1980s. And he'd come in and talk to Phil Goodell about collecting and things like that. And so he was collecting his life and he made a kind of an effort to collect turquoises from almost every place in New Mexico. Wow. And he asked Kelsey and I to come up to his house and, and look at his collection one day. And when we were pulling drawers open, I saw these turquoises that just blew my mind. They're, they're all from, you know, guaranteed to be from New Mexico localities. And I, I you know, I'm not usually a pushy guy, really. And <laughs> I feel very uncomfortable asking people for things, although I guess it's my job. But I asked, I said, Rex, that's such a fabulous collection of turquoise. Would you consider giving it to the museum? And he said, I thought you'd never ask. Uh, <laughs> great. So there we go. A quick little tour of our facility. That's fantastic. I, I, I know there are a lot of comments um, going on about people just dying to come down and visit the museum. But now, Virgil, um, there's the rumor that uh, you are about to retire. So um, tell us what you're going to be doing. Are you going to be around? What's the next step? Where are you going? Are you riding off into the sunset in a new Pinto? <laughs> no. I don't, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to sit down here in my office and, and put the little legs out on my gimbal here. And if you don't mind, try to be straight, try to okay. tip it the right way. All right. <laughs> so no, I'm not going to go anywhere. Um, right. My wife and I have a seven acre place of irrigated farmland out in the Rio Grande, out in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, Lisa has horses. We have chickens and ducks and turkeys and we have dogs and cats. I, I love this part of it, you know, for something, you know, Lisa was hesitant to come here in the first place, but ultimately we've come to really love this place and we want to stay here. And, and my kids, my, uh, my twins are up in Albuquerque mm -hmm. and my grand got a granddaughter up there and my uh, other daughter is down in Las Cruces. We're about as centrally located as we can get to those guys. So um, we're going to, we're going to hang out here and, and hopefully I've been told that I will be made emeritus and I'll still have a, the ability to work here in the museum and, and finish up some projects that I haven't quite finished yet. That's fantastic. And you're going to continue with your role on uh, SMMP? You're uh, part uh, of the no, planning I, committee? 
yeah, I, I still like to be, I'm still interested in how the world works, especially amongst the other curators and, and, and try to be uh, helpful and, and, uh, and, and contribute where I can. Uh, you know, I've, well, I've watched a lot of people who've retired and yeah. often, you know, as you get retired, your interests change and you kind of drift away. But maybe if I drifted away by that time, no one will remember me anymore. No, oh, I'm, I'm sure that would never happen. Hey, Virgil, we're about 15 minutes past the hour, so we are running long, but we are at the point in the show called our Quick Fire Five. So you know how this works. I've got five questions I'm going to ask you. There are two answers to each question. Each one of your answers is correct. We're going to see what the audience said and uh, see how well they know uh, uh, Virgil Luth. Are you ready? Oh, sounds like a game show. Yes, it pretty much is. So just... <laughs> Uh, I'll give you two responses and just the one that you resonate with quickly or, or, or most strongly with, that's the one you yell out. Well, okay. you don't have to yell, but you, you understand. Okay. So question number one, <clears throat> favorite drink, margarita in the Tucson desert or hot chocolate in the Rocky Mountain? I'd have to go with the margarita. Margarita. Good choice. <laughs> question number two your preference in shoes are we talking sandals or are we talking boots oh no i'm a i'm a flip-flop sandal guy or a, or a running shoe <laughs> love it okay question number three minerals the shapes of calcite or the colors of fluorite oh i, I definitely have to go with the colors of fluorite it has a more chemical basis there we go. Okay. There might have been a little hint in that uh, presentation that you gave in Denver. Question number four, your ideal night out, a movie theater or a live concert? It'd probably be a live concert. I really have a hard time paying attention to things. Okay. What kind of music do you like? Oh, I'm really into the this uh, indie rock stuff right now. Rock on, it. man. Sirius XMU is my favorite station right now. <laughs> Good deal. Okay, so that was about a night out. What about a night in? Is it TV and popcorn or a book by the fireplace? That's by TV and popcorn. TV and popcorn. Love it. Okay. Fireplaces That's are nice gonna too. do it. I'm sorry, what's that, Virgil? Hey, books and fireplaces are nice too. I'll do both. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Okay, so uh Eloise, do you have the answers that our audience has provided for our questions? Are we ready? Yes, we are. Hmm. Okay, question number one, drinks, margarita in the Tucson desert or hot chocolate in the Rocky Mountains? Virgil went with a margarita. What our audience say? Margarita in the Tucson desert. I think that's uh, always the one to pick anyway. Okay, well, <laughs> Tucson's happening next year, so uh, let's let the margaritas flow. <laughs> question number two, shoes, sandals, or boots? Virgil went with the sandals. What did our audience say? The wrong one, boots. And I think that's the only wrong question. Uh, wrong answer, at least. Let's keep going. Uh, uh, okay. Question number three, minerals, shapes of calcites or color of fluorites? Virgil chose the colors. Colors of fluorite, of course. It was obvious. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, night out, movie theater or live concert? Virgil went with a live concert. Live concerts, yes. Oh, not bad, not bad. And the final question, night in, TV and popcorn or book by the fireplace? Uh, no, this Virgil one was wrong TV. as well, book by the fireplace. But people were not wrong because Virgil cho chose both of them, so it's fine. Okay, all right. So three out of five, that's not bad. When you see Virgil in Tucson, go ahead, buy him a margarita and uh, compliment him <laughs> on the color of his sandals. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> Raquel, Eloise, how are we doing with Q&As? Are there questions that Virgil can answer? Yes, you know what, Virgil, if you wouldn't mind giving us a list of your um, latest publication and so that people can actually uh, see them. Actually, there is on the SMMP website, there is a list of the recent publications by the uh, curators um, that are SMMP members. So Virgil, if you uh, send us that uh, the, this list of uh, our, the latest articles, especially on Charisite and on the blue fluorites, we can put them on the SMMP website and I will redirect people to, uh, to the SMMP website to, so that they can read them directly. That so is good. there, Erin was saying uh, something very specific about um, Charisite dating. Do you have something published on that? 
Yeah, a couple of papers, and it's in chemical geology. Um, okay. It was with uh, it's the sour gas hydrothermal jar sites where we first published the dates. And then I had a, another student, uh, Kim Samuels Crow. Uh, she published a paper in, in chemical geology for her master's about the techniques of dating jar site that are mixed with clays, like from up at Cuesta. So, but also my entire CV is on my our website here at the Bureau, geoinfo.nmt.edu. And you can go to my staff page, click on my staff page, and there's a link to my CV. Perfect. That's uh, That makes life easier. So, you know what? Erin answered most of the questions. So, thank you very much, Erin. <laughs> you did all the job already. And uh, there's only one question left, pretty much. Uh, who does your labels? Is it from a computer? Do you have a co computer model or something? The labels yes. on the on display. Yeah, the, the, the labels are a template that we made from an Avery uh, business card uh, software that came with Windows at one time, okay, or with an HP printer, I don't remember, but it's specifically made for the perforated uh, business cards you can buy from a book of a store, and then we just created our own template for that. Although Kelsey has been messing around with our with our cards a lot and adding things to it, so I don't know if we have a standard anymore. Most of the you know, I'm kind of a, in some ways, I'm a purist. I, I, you know, name formula, where it comes from, how we got it. That That's the old kind of old school. I'm afraid I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old too then. Uh, well, I don't I don't know, Raquel, if you had uh, any other questions that you saw from the chat, but I think Erin did all the work, seriously. So thank you very that's much. Good. Thanks, Erin. Um, Virgil, Virgil, I hope that you will still attend all the shows. We can still see you and you will continue on giving the great lectures, these educational lectures that you give are really wonderful. And I invite all um, to join and to see, to come and see all the lectures that Virgil does at shows or symposium because you learn a lot and it's so clear. It's so, I mean, it's, it's great. So Keep on doing this job and we look forward to uh, working with you with the SMMP as well. And I uh, wish you all the best. And I'm looking forward to meeting the new person when you will uh, hire her or, or him. That's right. That, that should happen pretty soon. The, the job will be closing up here in a little bit. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get somebody who, who loves minerals and will take care of this place. Besides Kelsey, so. he'll still be here taking care of it. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. So thank you, Virgil, thank you for thank the you opportunity. So much. <laughs> thank you. Well, Virgil, thank you again for such a wonderful experience and such a great tour through the museum and sharing so much of your background. And for our audience, as you can tell from the number of curators and curatix guests that we have on our show, all of us here at Mineral Talks Live, we're passionate about mineral museums and the role that they play in the world. They're the bastions of minerals, mineral knowledge, and mineral history for our industry. And perhaps the greatest property that all these mineral museums uh, share is that they exist to share knowledge and specimens with all of us. So it only makes sense that we, as a community, give back to them. Now, throughout the run of the show, we've received numerous emails from people asking how they can help out museums and which of those museums can benefit both best from their support. So based on this, Raquel, Eloise, and I felt that we could further help our mineral community by directly connecting our viewers with mineral museums around the world. So if you're a collector and perhaps have specimens you'd like to donate, information you'd like to share, or even grant access to mineral localities for the, mineral for the museum community, drop us a line at info at mineraltalkslive.com and we can discuss these options and others with you and help you find the best fit for your donation. Both Raquel and Eloise are longtime members of the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, one of our program sponsors, and they can quickly spread the word among uh, worldwide uh, mineral museum, the community and the mineral clubs. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Eloise, you're currently the president and I believe Raquel is the treasurer, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so you have no better connection into the SMMP than uh, two of our, 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 our people here at Mineral Talks Live. So that email, once again, is info at mineraltalkslive.com. And that's our show for today. If you happened to miss last month's show with fine mineral photographer Laszlo Kupi, well, you missed a great show. However, that show has just gone live today. It, it's going to be online in about 20 minutes. And so you can point your browser over to go.mineraltalkslive.com slash episode 54, 
and you can watch a great photographer really share his knowledge and passion about mineral photography with all of us. Take a look. Remember to subscribe and tell a friend. Thank you for tuning in today. Have a fantastic November, a wonderful Thanksgiving, and we'll catch up with you again on our next show, which will be on December 1st. Aloha, Virgil. Mahalo again for being on our show. Take care, everyone. And that's a wrap. Virgil, fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I knew I'd go long, but I noticed you always did, so I didn't feel bad. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's my signature move. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. That was wonderful. Thank you all. I appreciate it. All right. Be well. I know, Eloise, you have a dinner to get to, so... That we're gonna we're gonna end it right now. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining and see you next month, December first. Bye.